welcome back friends. We're going to be talking about a very important subject now that's often the missing link in, into why people are not getting well. I've heard of people say, I had breast cancer, tried the natural way and it just didn't work. I had ovarian cancer, tried the natural way and it didn't work. I'm always intrigued as to what this natural way is. Because yes, definitely we need water, we need exercise, we need early nights, we need nourishing food. That's all fairly common sense, isn't it? But what I'm about to tell you today is the missing link into why those two ladies didn't heal. In fact, why many didn't heal. And it, it also explains why Angelina Jolene did not have to remove her breasts and many women follow suit. They actually just needed to balance their hormones. So I'm going to begin by going through some of the symptoms of a female having a hormonal imbalance. And then I'm going to give you the symptoms of a man having a hormonal imbalance. So with a woman, it would be early periods. Do you know normal is 16 to 18? And you hardly ever hear that today. We're getting young girls who are getting their periods at nine. That's a hormonal imbalance. Very heavy periods, very painful periods. Uh, sore breasts at period time, premenstrual tension. These are all symptoms of a hormonal imbalance. Also, polycystic ovarian syndrome, ovaries that have cysts growing on them, fibroids in the uterus, endometriosis, lumps in the breast, breast cancer, cervical cancer, also polyps in the, in the vagina, in the uterus, also depression and heart disease. These are some of the symptoms of a hormonal imbalance. What about a man? For a man, some of the symptoms are low sperm count. A lot of couples can't have children today. Sometimes it's the man, sometimes it's the woman. Also penile dysfunction or erectile dysfunction, inability to hold an erection. In Australia, the current figures are 50% of men over the age of 40 are having trouble with this. That's crazy. Sorry, I got that mixed up. It's 40% of men over the age of 50 are struggling with this. And also prostate problems. A person with a man with prostate problems, it's an indication of a hormonal imbalance. Too much of the female hormone can cause a man to be effeminate, and too much of the male hormone can cause a woman to be masculine. All of these are symptoms of a hormonal imbalance. What I want to do this morning is I want to take you through the monthly cycle and then I want to show you what throws the cycle out of balance and then I want to finish by showing you what brings the balance back. Notice that our sex hormones are made from cholesterol and that is why they've just added breast cancer to one of the side effects of the cholesterol lowering medication. If you don't have enough cholesterol, you can't make your sex hormones. From cholesterol, your body makes pregnenolone, and from pregnenolone, your body makes progesterone. Progesterone is a key hormone because from progesterone, estrogen is made. From progesterone, testosterone is made, and from progesterone, the adrenal hormones are made. I'm going to explain the monthly cycle like a dance, because it is like a dance. Different players come onto the stage at different times of the month. Progesterone is one of our star players, and progesterone is going to be wearing a green dress in this dance and progesterone's nickname is happy hormone. What's the old saying? Happy wife, happy life. You know, when you've got a happy lady who's running the home, the whole family is happy. We've got a lot of unhappy ladies because of a hormonal imbalance. Estrogen is the other player in the dance of the hormones. An oestrogen's going to be wearing a red dress. An oestrogen's role in the body is that of a cell proliferator. In other words, causing massive cell growth. So it is oestrogen that causes the skinny young girl to develop into a beautiful shapely woman. But if that beautiful shapely woman gets out of shape, um, it's usually because of the oestrogen has remained high and we're going to look at why that is so. I like an oestrogen to good slave, bad master. How we love our fires in the middle of winter, but you know, fire can get out of control and burn a whole town down. 
we can't function without water and how we love diving into a stream in a hot weather. But floods can come and wipe out a town. So that's why I say I like an estrogen to fire and water, good slave, necessary slave, but bad master. So estrogen isn't bad, it's only when it's out of control, as you can see, as you will see in this presentation. So let's look at the monthly cycle. It's a 28 day cycle. And day one is the day a woman begins to menstruate. Day one of the monthly cycle, her progesterone levels are low. Day one of the monthly cycle, estrogen levels are also low. But by day seven, they're starting to rise up until day 11, they're quite high. So looking at this as the dance, the star player around day 14, the middle of the month, is oestrogen. So what effect does oestrogen have on the body? We're going to go to the stage where the dance is played out, which is the reproductive organs of a woman's body. So this is the uterus, they're the fallopian tubes, they're the eggs connected by a ligament, that's the cervix, and this is the birth canal. At this time of the month, oestrogen is, is causing massive cell growth in the lining of the uterus causing the blood nest once again to develop. Oestrogen is also causing eggs in the ovaries to be developed. Oestrogen is also causing a form of lubricant to be released in the birth canal. Now by day 14, a fully developed egg bursts forth from the ovaries. Those little filaments on the end of the fallopian tube pull the egg up. So the egg comes up into the fallopian tubes and the fallopian tube is ever moving basically like this, causing that egg to move up, up, up. Now the hole where the egg bursts forth develops a blister and that blister is called the corpus luteum. I'm writing it in green because corpus luteum is the main site of progesterone production in a woman's body. Can you see the importance of a woman ovulating every month? Because when she ovulates, her corpus luteum is made. And when her cor corpus luteum is made, that maintains progesterone. And remember, progesterone is the precursor or the balancer of all those other hormones. So progesterone is such an important hormone. I'm just trying to give you a more symmetrical dress here. So around day 14, oestrogen gets the message it can go backstage because we've already got our blood nest, we've got our lubricant and our egg. There's no need for more oestrogen. With the development of corpus luteum around day 14, then progesterone levels rise. Progesterone is now the star player in the dance of the hormones. So what effect does progesterone have? Progesterone has a ripening effect on the lining of the uterus, putting the finishing touches on the uterus. Progesterone also heightens a woman's mood at this time of the month, to the point of increasing her sexual desire at this time of the month. But progesterone has another effect. Let me magnify the cervix so you can see. So the cervix is usually like this, two lips and a mucus plug. Under the effect of progesterone at this time of the month, the mucus plug goes, the lips come up a little tighter and a special form of lubricant is released around the cervix. And this lubricant is very profuse, thin and stringy and it is designed to facilitate the entry of sperm up into the uterus. So you can see the stage is set for the entry of man. Did you know that between 200 and 500 million sperm are released with one ejaculation? The sperm cell is the smallest cell in the body. Now sometimes up to half of that sperm comes straight back out. If the sperm meet this cervix, very difficult to gain entry. If the sperm meet this cervix, that lubricant literally grabs that sperm and shoots it up into the uterus and it's got a long journey, long way to go. Some of them go down the wrong road and they basically die and get absorbed back into the blood. Some of them go down the right road and aha, they've found their prize, which is the egg. Do you know, a young man picked 
pulled up off the YouTube a little video clip of this journey of the sperm. It's quite fascinating. And you wouldn't believe what they're up against. No wonder God put between 200 and 500 million. <laughs> and I saw a photograph one day of 15 sperm all trying to gain entry. Do you know, as soon as the sperm just gets the tip of its head in, the rest of the egg shuts down. It shuts down. It even releases a toxic fluid to kill off the other sperm. Just incredible. Occasionally, it just so happens that two enter at exactly the same time. That's when the twins share the placenta. Just incredible. As soon as that sperm is in there, its DNA starts to unravel. The DNA of the egg start to unravel. It's just an incredible process. And within a matter of days, we've got the first two cells. Did you know that the DNA of a new human being is perfectly intact? So when does life begin? There's a lot of discussion on this. Yeah. Within days of conception. Because that DNA never has been and will never be. I think there's going to be some surprises on the resurrection morning. Is that right? Yeah. You know, one lady began to cry. She had had a miscarriage at only, only three weeks. She cried when she realised that there will be a little, a little soul. Incredible. So what happens with conception? With conception, progesterone levels soar 200%. Don't we say when a woman's pregnant, she's just blossoming? My daughter-in-law is just blossoming at the moment. Her baby's due, I think, in about three weeks. If a lady said, well, I didn't blossom, <laughs> what, what would that indicate that she, she's low in progesterone? And there is a reason for that. Now, there is one hormone, progesterone, but there are three hormones to make up estrogen. There's estrone, and that's called E1. And E1 has strong cell proliferator action on the body. There's estradiol and it's called E2 and it has strong cell proliferator action. Whereas estriol is called the delicate estrogen. So we're going to give it a little heart there because it's a delicate estrogen. In, estrogen. In pregnancy, it is estriol levels that rise with the progesterone. But... If there was no conception, by day 26, progesterone's given the message to go backstage, to drop down, and by day 26, estrogen is also given the message to drop. Now, when both of those levels drop, the blood supply to the uterus is cut, and when the blood supply to the uterus is cut, then the blood nest comes away, and we are once again day one of the monthly cycle. When my children were little, just three and four, I used to tell them that mother has a blood nest. And if father puts a seed in, a baby grows. But if no seed comes in, the blood nest will come away. Do you know that's the best way to start is when they're little, with just simple little descriptions like that. And then as they get older, they, they can ask you and their, and their uh, understanding of it increases. I can remember, because we lived on a farm, that father duck would get on top of mother duck and he'd start pecking the back of her head and my little three-year-old William would run along and push father duck off and get mother duck and protect her from that naughty father duck. You know, when children grow up on the, on the farm, you know, they also get a very simple and, and yet, um, you know, I believe that the way God meant it to be, the education, just as their, just as their understanding is, is able. I'd like to talk for a moment on sperm because sperm is an alien to a woman's body and when sperm enters woman's body, her immune system rises to attack. But when sperm goes through the prostate gland of a man, it takes on an immune suppressant property. So when woman's immune system rises to attack, the immune suppressant property of sperm knocks back her immune system and sperm gets through, otherwise none of us would be here. Now, a woman's body has memory, and every time her husband's sperm enters her, she sees familiarity, and she bases, the immune system rises and goes, oh, it's just husband, we'll just stand back. 
and sperm enters. But can you imagine how dangerous it is if a woman has multiple partners? You can imagine how dangerous it is in the area of anal sex, how it can just wipe out that immune system. What's a pap smear? A pap smear is a little scrape or a little nick taken out of the cervix. Let's say a woman has a pap smear. That night she is intimate with her husband. Her immune system is trying to heal that, but in the presence of sperm, what does her immune system have to do? Stand back. Let's say it happens before she goes to sleep that night. And so the immune system can't deal with it even all night. And in the morning, gravity causes the sperm to come away. Let's say she's a very sexually active woman and this is happening two nights out of three. Six months later, she has another pap smear. They just so happen to take it on the same spot. What's the result? Abnormal cells. What caused the abnormal cells? The first pap smear that was never allowed to heal. Women should be told that for four weeks after a pap smear, not to allow sperm to enter her. Would it take four weeks? Not in a healthy woman. But there are some women that go to bed too late, that don't exercise, don't drink enough water, live on too much coffee, are eating devitalized food. It would take four weeks in that woman. In a healthy woman, it should be healed in about 10 days. One lady said, my husband can't wait four weeks. I said, well, he needs to wear a condom, but that sperm must not enter until that cervix is healed. So let's have a look now of what's causing the imbalance. Because as we've looked at Newton's third law of motion, for every action, there is an equal and an opposite reaction. There is a reason for the imbalance that we are seeing. And the main cause of the imbalance, one of the main causes, is the contraceptive pill. 1957, the first contraceptive pill was introduced to women. 1960s is called the sexual revolution. Women wanted to be able to have sex without falling pregnant, so they were given the pill. But one writer in Australia, she calls it the mass murder of millions of women. Men and women have, are, and will continue to pay a very high price for this so-called sexual freedom. What is the pill? What does it do? The pharmaceutical companies grow acres and acres of Mexican wild yam. Now that Mexican wild yam contains a plant chemical called diostinin. And in a laboratory, diostinin can be converted into progesterone. Pharmaceutical company can't patent that. It's like they can't patent sodium bicarb either because you can't patent something that's already there. So what they do is they add a few more atoms and come up with a synthetic progesterone. They add a few more atoms and they come up with a synthetic estrogen. You see, in the 80s, the pill contained pure estrogen and they quickly acknowledged that that pure estrogen was feeding cancer. So every pill today has to contain the synthetic estrogen and the synthetic progesterone. Has that fixed everything? No, because it's progestin or progestone and it blocks your progesterone receptor sites. It really hasn't fixed anything. But when the woman takes the pill, it's fed into that biochemical pathway that your body uses to make its own hormones and it causes a disruption and the body says, must be pregnant. So it stops releasing the egg so the woman doesn't fall pregnant. So for three weeks, she takes the pill. And then for one week, she stops and takes a sugar pill and the body goes, oh, mustn't be pregnant, choke and bleed. After a week, back on the hormones, oh, must be pregnant. Can you see this imbalance that's starting to happen? But what I wanna illustrate to you is what's this causing? You see, your number one hormone should be progesterone because it balances all the others. Month after month on the pill, no ovulation, no corpus luteum, where's progesterone going? Month after month on the pill with its synthetic estrogen, where's estrogen going? We've got a problem, sadly too common today, called estrogen dominance, progesterone deficiency. Good slave, bad master is now the master. And what does the cycle look like now? Estrogen's up here. Estrogen with its cell proliferator action causing massive cell growth in the uterus. There's the fibroids. Massive cell growth on the ovaries. There's your polycystic ovarian syndrome. There's your cysts on the ovaries. There's your endometriosis. This is your abnormal cells on the uterus, on the cervix. 
These are your cysts in the breasts. This is your breast cancer. This is your uterine cancer, your ovarian cancer. And the lady cannot lose weight because of the high estrogen. And the ladies were the baby boomers. Now they're going through menopause. How are they faring? They can't lose weight. They're having hot flushes. Estrogen causes capillary dilation, causes all the blood to rush to the skin. Then, oh, hot. Where's, by the way, where's progesterone in all this? Down here. The woman's depressed. Got no happy hormone at all. She has no desire for sex. And when she has sex, it's painful because the cells lining the birth canal have become so tender. There is no lubricant. She is of all women most miserable. And she knows, she looks at her husband and he's starting to look at his secretary. It's a terrible state of affairs. So the woman goes to the doctor, she's in a mess. So he gives her something to, hot, to stop the hot flushes and it will, it's called Hormone replacement therapy. Why does it stop the flushes? Because now the body thinks it's pregnant again. And instead of putting its energies to the skin, it puts its energies in the breasts and the uterus. Six years later, she has a lump. It's breast cancer. Her doctor takes her off HRT immediately. Why? He knows. So if you say to the physician, why do you do it if you know? He says, well, she was suffering and it brought her relief. That is true. But you ask the woman, what would you prefer, breast cancer or hot flushes? What's the answer? Bring on the flushes. <laughs> I'll build a pool. <laughs> I'll get a fan. <laughs> and the other thing he says is not every woman gets breast cancer, and that's true. But I don't know. I'm not interested in playing Russian real life with my health. Russian roulette with my health. No, it is, it is certainly not the answer. Now let's have a look at the daughters of the baby boomers. They're the women that are getting breast cancer. They're the women that are cutting off their breasts. They're the women who are getting polycystic ovarian syndrome. They're the women that are getting the fibroids, the cysts under the endometriosis. One 25-year-old girl said, doctor says I've got endometriosis. He says I'll be all right when I go through menopause. What's that, another 25 years of suffering? What's he just acknowledged? <clears throat> when a woman goes to, through menopause, her hormones drop. He's just acknowledged it's that high estrogen that's feeding it because when you go through menopause, it drops. Now, if a woman's balance is right and she goes through menopause, they drop. If a woman's imbalance is like this and she goes through menopause, what's happening? Can you see the imbalance is still there? Some women say, no, no, Barbara, that was 30 years ago I was on the pill. I say, that's right. And the balance is still out. Some women won't have weight gain, weight gain. Some women will get breast cancer. Some women won't get breast cancer or flushes, but they'll have migraines. So there, there's all different scenarios. One lady who'd been on the pill for seven years, but she lived quite healthy. She went through menopause and got all the symptoms. And she thought she'd be right because it was 30 years ago. And she'd had no symptoms up to left. And I've met some people who've never been on the pill, their mothers have never been on the pill, and yet they've got the imbalance. What's happening to the men, the sons of the women who are on the pill? They're the ones with penile dysfunction. They're the ones with low sperm count. They're the ones that are experience this effeminate behavior. You be careful what I say in Australia on that one. It's a touchy subject. You know, it's not the only cause, but it certainly are contributing factors. There's more. What happens when a chicken is fully developed in five weeks? That's a bit scary, isn't it? Growth stimulants. It's against the law to give chickens growth stimulants now, so they've genetically modified them to produce more estrogen. That's why if you want to have your own chooks, sorry, hens, you call them hens or chickens, you have to go out to an old guy living up in the hills who's got the same chickens that his father and his father before him had, is that right? You need to get ones that haven't been touched. <clears throat> what about fish? Well, when you've got 80% of women on the pill or HRT, the sewage goes out to the sea, the fish are feeding on that. 
and there's something else that's affecting the fish and that is the plastics mm -hmm. in fact it's huge it's it's causing terrible problems in sea life now the plastics What about cattle? Well, you know what God meant cattle to eat, don't you? Grass, <laughs> grass. But there are a lot of grain fed cattle now and a lot of that grain can be mold, you know, have been touched with mold because it's not fit for human consumption. So if I give it to the animals. You've also got um, growth stimulants being given to cattle, even though it's against the law that the pharmaceutical companies have arranged it such that you can do a blood test five days before market and not picked up the growth stimulant. That's scary, isn't it? Mm. So if it's in the meat, it's in the product. We're going to show you how to make lentils taste fantastic so you don't have to go to this one. You see, in, in fruits, vegetables, nuts, grains and legumes are all the nutrients that this human body requires. Plastics. I think it's impossible to get away from plastic. It's handy stuff. But we need to be very mindful of not storing things in plastic. So your drinking bottle, it should be uh, stainless steel or glass, or I have one that I travel, and it's a hard plastic. And that hard plastic doesn't have the, the chemicals in it. You see, estrogen in its molecular structure has a phenyl ring. And that fennel ring unlocks the door to let the estrogen into the cell. So there are some chemicals today they're putting in plastics that have the fennel ring. There's nonylphenol. And nonylphenol is what makes the plastic soft. So you can squeeze it. And another one is bisphenol A. Or it's often called BPA. You know, you can get plastic that's BPA free and they're usually the hard plastic. You can get some healthy baby bottles that are the hard plastic. But notice what they all have. They all have the fennel ring. And that's, quite, that's why plastics, is, they're called xenoestrogens. That's estrogen mimickers. They mimic estrogen. They get into the estrogen receptor site. That's one of the reasons for this hormone imbalance epidemic that we're seeing is the exposure to the plastics. One of the worst is hot soup into a plastic takeaway container. Um, also, if I'm traveling and I'm thirsty, I'll buy a, a bottle of water and I'll drink it, but then I'll put that in the bin. When you keep using those bottles, they keep breaking down. So be very careful of what's stored in there long. So I try and store all my food in glass or stainless steel. But also be mindful of what's touching your skin, especially ladies. There are, there are three plastic fabrics. One is acrylic, polyester and nylon. And how many bras are made out of those? You know, I, I go in, into the shops and investigate and you can get a a very nice sports bra from Fruit of the Loom and it's 95% cotton. Do you know a little bit of polyester is all right because you want a bit of stretch in there. Also, Modal, M-O-D-A-L, it's the cellulose spun from the birch tree. Also, tensile, rayon and viscose are all made out of wood pulp. So they basically can be considered natural fibres. Now it is true that cotton is the most sprayed crop in Australia. So when you buy cotton, you should wash it and put it on the clothesline. You know, in Australia, we hang everything out on the clothesline because you know what that sun does? It disinfects, <laughs> it cleanses your clothes. I was said to one lady in America, I like hanging my clothes on the clothesline. She said, oh, my grandmother used to do that. <laughs> we, need to, we need to get those clotheslines back. What also is estrogen mimickers is these xenoestrogens in herbicides, insecticides, pesticides, chemicals. A lot of chemicals break down to substances that mimic estrogen. I'm going to tell you a story about one other aspect 
This happened in about 1985 in Puerto Rico. There was an epidemic of children going through puberty at five years of age, and they traced it to an anabolic agent that they were giving to cattle to make them grow quickly. And it was a breakdown from a mold waste. And this mold waste is called xerolinone. And the product was called xerolol. Now the farmers thought because it wasn't actually a chemical, they could give it to the cows right up until, you know, a couple of weeks before market. But as I showed you on Monday, these mold wastes are quite toxic. So that xerolinone, that mold waste, has an estrogenic effect on the body. In fact, grains grow it easily. And that's why people on high wheat diets, they can be getting a little bit of an overload of xerolinone. Because a small amount is allowed through, otherwise no wheat would ever be passed. So they discovered that women were eating meat in pregnancy that had been that had, had the xerolol, causing it to grow quickly. And then that was affecting their babies. So their babies were going through puberty at five years of age. This is in Puerto Rico, 1985. So I'm going to show you four different types of estrogen. Now these are four cells. And these are four estrogen receptor sites on the cell. So this one is the xenoestrogen. And xenoestrogen is 20,000 times stronger than the plant. So there's the plant there. So, sorry, I've made a mistake there. That's human. So how big xenoestrogen? It's huge. And this is xerolinone, and it's 1,000 times stronger than the human. So it's about this big. Well, how big's human? Human estrogen's that big. And it's 20,000 times stronger than the plant. So how big's the plant? The plant is only a tiny little thing that just slips into the receptor site like that. So where do you find the plant's estrogens? You find the plant estrogens in red clover, in some greens, in soy. And this plant estrogen, because it's a plant, it comes to the receptor site and it knocks. Excuse me, can I come in? And the cell says, no, we've got enough. So you know what the plant estrogen does? Sits in the receptor site, protecting that receptor site from these two guys who are the nasties. But if it knocks on the door and says to the cell, do you need me? And the cell says, oh, yes, please. It will come in. Psalm 104, verse 14, the Bible says, God gave herbs for the service of man. I love that illustration because plants come in and say, where would you like me? I am here to serve you. <laughs> Whereas these chemicals, they said, get out of my way. I'm coming in whether you need it or not. <laughs> and those xenoestrogens have this song this strong cell proliferator action. Can you see that? Now here's the soybean grown in America today. It's called Roundup Ready. Why is it called Roundup Ready? It's been genetically modified to resist Roundup. Problem number one. And a farmer told me this. He said five times before harvest, the field is sprayed. He said all the weeds die and the soybean keeps growing. That's a bit scary, isn't it? Mm. So that soybean not only has it been genetically modified, but it has five doses of chemicals in it. That soybean will increase breast cancer. That soybean will increase prostate cancer, not because of the natural estrogens, but because of the xeno. Can you see that? There's a lot of, a lot of controversy on soy, isn't there? One lady, I know she did a thesis on soy, and when people ask her about soy, she's got a one-lined answer. She said, it's real easy. God made it good, man mucked it up. End of story. <laughs> so if you eat soy, I don't eat a lot, but I might have it once or sometimes twice a week. I make sure it's non-GMO organically grown. Then there's not a problem. 
What most people don't understand is what I have just explained to you, is the difference in the different estrogens.